I'm Aaron Meyer, and you're listening to the 199 Podcast. Today we're talking to Jesse Washington, author of John Thompson's biography, among other things, about black basketball pioneers in celebration of Black History Month. We get into the Fab Five, Georgetown, UNLV, the Globe Trotters, and more. Now, on to the show. Yeah, isn't it amazing when Michigan can keep this game to a 19-foot, 9-inch game inside that three-point? All right, welcome to the 19-9 podcast. I've got Jesse Washington back. He is the author of one of my favorite books from last year and a book that's made a lasting impact on my life called I Came as a Shadow, a book about Coach John Thompson. I'm back tonight to talk about the Pioneers collection that is coming out in February uh, to sell about to celebrate black excellence, shaping the game of basketball. And I don't know where you want to start. I, I obviously had 1984 Georgetown in mind. That's one of the collections that's coming out, but there is so much. I think that le- the more you learn about uh, basketball history, the more you learn about the, you know, the, the black men that contributed to the game. And it's just fun to resurface it because they were ignored, you know, for so long, for so long. So telling those stories feels powerful and new still. Yeah, man. You know, I do appreciate that about your collection in that, um, you know, you're really shining a light on some of these past eras that are really important. And it's more than just a pair of shorts, man. There's, there's real people who wore them, who went through real things. And so particularly in some of the eras and, and Coach Thompson, in me working with him to write his autobiography, I learned about pioneers. <laughs> you know, I learned about John McClendon and Cal Irvin and Big House Gaines. And I had known Big House Gaines a little bit, but these other men, you know, so. so uh, and then there's a lot about these uh the, the Georgetown teams, the UNLV teams, uh, the Texas Western teams. There's a lot about those that young people don't know. Yeah. And so big up for keeping all that alive. Yeah, so let's start. You said McClendon there. I mean, I don't even know if people know know that name. I I know, and I don't, I don't even know. I get confused yes. now from let's learning start all this with stuff. The John McClendon. Yeah, because Who is this man is? yeah, because it's just like the fast break, you know, like oh oh, th- just that, you know. Let's go back before that. Yeah. Let's go back. So I'm gonna make. I'm gonna, I got a confession. Okay. I'm I'm working with Coach Thompson on his book, and he he starts saying John McClendon this and John McClendon that. Like he knew, like I knew who he was mm-hmm. and I should have known who he was, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. I had never heard this man's name before. So I go home and Google this up <laughs> with a quickness and I'm like, wow, I can't believe it. So John McClendon attended the University of Kansas when James Naismith was there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just, oh, that guy. <laughs> oh, that guy. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, the team was segregated. I don't know if, if McClendon was a hooper himself. Yeah. But the team was segregated, so he couldn't be involved in it. But he, you know, he had an association with and learned from James Naismith. And then he went on to coach at some of these black colleges during the segregated era of college basketball. And he was the coach at a pivotal game in basketball history, Mm. The Secret Game. Yeah. Really good book about it. If you if you want to pick it up, that's the title of it, The Secret Game. So he coached a black college. I think it was A&T down there. And I'm sorry if I'm messing up the name. Forgive me if I'm getting the exact name of the college wrong. And they played Duke. And it was one of the first times, if not the first time, that a black team and a white team had played. And they had to do it in secret because of segregation. This is like in, I think, the 40s. Mm-hmm. And uh, when, they, when, when the ball got tipped up, McClendon had them doing something that no one had ever seen in basketball. And when they got the rebound, they ran. They threw it up the court, layups, dunks, and then they full court pressed. And they're like, what is this? And they ran Duke out the gym literally um and so these are are aspects of basketball that other people have been credited with inventing yep. or popularizing red right back but coach john thompson said that john mcclendon if he didn't invent those concepts he was one of the very first people to apply them in a real basketball game and then he went on to coach 
um, international teams and and John Thompson played for him on an overseas tour and, um, you know, won many national titles in the segregated era and just a, a tremendous, tremendous basketball mind who's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So that you're talking about that and, you know, I, I, it can be a bit of semantics, like who was the first person to do this or that. But I think that what we're t- more talking about is that pioneering spirit, the fact that you're going out there and doing something different on a consistent basis, applying the things that you've learned in new ways. And, you know, I really found that we uh, had a Globetrotters collection that came out too. And they did a lot of that, that stuff too, you know, with the, I think they get parodied a little bit now and uh, you know, that's that's fine. And they're great. Remember, they're still a great, I know. They were the greatest players on and the They were, yeah. In the twenties and the thirties and, and, and even a few decades after that. Yep. They were the greatest. Yeah. They like, were just the like greatest. Like beating George Mike and, and the Lakers. Like they showed up, played the Lakers, the, Nash, the world champions, beat them. You know? And it, yeah. So you want tricks, we'll give you these tricks, but we'll also give you this work. Yes. So now. Low trotters, you know, there's a whole segregated era of professional basketball. Mm-hmm. And my friend Claude, the, the great Claude Johnson, who runs the the Black Fives collection. And he coined this phrase, the Black Fives, for when black people were not allowed to play professional basketball. And so they had a whole world of black basketball. And it was fascinating. <laughs> Clubs, barnstorming around the country. And the Globetrotters were really an integral part of that. And so, um, you know, that that whole era, don't disrespect the Globetrotters. I know. Do not think that they were clowns. Yeah. In, the yeah, they were entertainers, and I, but the the genesis of that too was that the entertainment led to innovation too. They weren't just like cl- you know clowning the entire time. They were developing moves, and you know you saw that later with like and one is probably the 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 most recent kind of popularized version of that. But there's always like people out there now. It's kind of the YouTubers that are that are bringing different moves or different ideas, and that's what's so neat about basketball is that because it's a worldwide sport. And it's so open now that that and and it's so individual at times that you can develop that in small niche areas without having to have a, you know a huge setup. And I think that's what's so so great about some of these so many of these teams. Yeah, it's amazing, man. And you know the game is changing at an exponential rate. Yeah. And the things that guys do and the the you know like I mean I'm old enough to remember when uh, you know. Um, somebody won the dunk contest, the NBA dunk contest, just going underneath their leg. <laughs> yeah. and, and now high school kids are yeah. doing it in games. Yeah, Bronny did it uh, just casually in one of his game, right. in the middle of one of his games. You know what I'm saying? And so yeah. all of these handles and tricks and everything that now are just, you see everywhere you go. Um, and it's cool, man. It's a great thing. But I really put the, the, the globe trotters at the front of that. And then I'm glad you mentioned and one because that was a huge and extraordinarily influential era. And I think the and one handle is in the NBA right now. Yeah, no, you know? no doubt. I mean, Kyrie no doubt has about a, it. Kyrie is definitely influenced for by that, sure. You know? Yeah, among others. Yeah, among others, man. Where the game is at right now, you know, I just came back from hooping tonight. Nice. Uh, me, me and my man Damon Young were talking about the fact that now guys are pretty much unguardable. Yeah. Like not even the greats, but just the skill level is so high that the best guys in, at every level are unguardable. And even like, I mean, I use someone like, and NBA guys are so good, man. They're, I know. Just top the fifteenth guy will just come to wherever Cook. you think you're playing at yeah. and just destroy. But like Spencer Dinwiddie is pretty much un- one-on-one oh. in the NBA. He's pretty much scoring at yeah. will. Yeah. You know, and so I, I credit the Globe Trotters with pushing the envelope of what is possible on a basketball court to, for the next generations to follow. For sure. Speaking of pushing the next generations, I uh, wanted to talk a little, see what you knew about the uh, University of San Francisco back to back national titles uh, with the guy who just passed away, Bill Russell. Uh, some some people might have heard of him, uh, but an incredible college player too. Uh, you know, basically has the alley oop not part of the game. <laughs> he he brings that into popularity and this just defensive presence um, that was pretty incredible. And, and an interesting fact that they didn't have. An, the first all 
all black starting lineup, but often would play five black players at once. So also innovative in there and there. And then off the court, he's doing all this amazing stuff as well. And just, you know, such a courageous man. And to, you know, it's, it's hard to, and to read some of this stuff, it just, it seems like it, it's hard to believe that's real. I know it is. And people need to know what he went through too. Uh, because that, that makes it all the more amazing, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, Bill Russell, a, uh, a giant of our nation in every sense of the word and more so for what he stood for and the way he stood up for things. Um, Hey, I gotta say, I don't know much about that team that San Francisco team other than they won back to back yeah that's all right but tell me like what really stands out to you as far as one of the experiences that they went through or Russell went through well so that, so they go what, yeah so he what? goes to he's from Louisiana and he go they go back there to play this game and they just talk about uh, you know stuff that is typical but you I feel like I know Russell in this way, right? I've watched this guy. I've watched highlights of him forever. I've seen him at every NBA finals for my whole life, basically. And so you have like this connection with him. He's kind of this grandfatherly figure uh, and always so well composed and well spoken. And then you read about this experience that he had where he's not allowed to stay with his teammates in the same hotel room where they're making monkey noises on the court and throwing change at them. And it's just like the the worst of humanity. And the, you know, and he wanted to to play. And I and I found that thread with the Globetrotters and a lot of these guys. They loved the the game and they really felt like they were we're doing something by going out there and you know it's, it just takes a lot of courage like I don't know I love basketball too and I, but I think about like that experiencing that on that the personal uh affronts would be it would be a real challenge besides just going out and trying to hoop you know that just is it's amazing you know you're exactly right you know and uh coach Thompson in his book talked about you know uh Bill Russell now coach Thompson uh, you know but uh, just a legendary figure for his black consciousness. And he said that Bill Russell was the first person he ever knew who called himself black. <laughs> and these terms that we use to describe ourselves mm-hmm. have evolved over the years. And, you know, but Bill Russell had a huge influence on Coach Thompson, who was very a very observant person and mm-hmm. rather quiet at that time and watched and observed and he saw what Russell would put up with and what he wouldn't tolerate. Hmm. And Russell refused to play in a couple of games when they went to segregated cities with the Celtics and things like that. Hmm. So, um, you know, the thing that I always think about when we hear these stories and like you say, they're, they're just, we know them and yet we try to put them in some other era, like, Oh, that's all past history. Yeah. You know, getting monkey noises or not being allowed to stay in the same hotel and things like that. But you know, Bill Russell just died and yeah. he lived through it. There's <laughs> yeah. a lot of people walking around yeah. right now today who experience those things yeah. on both sides. You know, I mean, we saw Jerry Jones was <laughs> at this, you know, at the scene of the crime yeah. in an infamous segregation moment in this nation's history. So uh, the thing that I always remember when we hear about people like Bill Russell going through these things is that so many people here today live that it's not that far in the past mm, that's pretty good yeah it's powerful too to think about that to, to not try to maybe not try to compartmentalize it or think of it as past but realize that it's still like something to be vigilant about All right, well, let's talk a little George. You mentioned uh, Coach Thompson. Let's talk a little Georgetown 84 because this is an uh, un- unbelievable team. Um, <laughs> you know, yes. the, they've got the Hoya paranoia here. And I was kind of curious what your what coach's view was on their characterization uh, because yes. they're a very interesting team. I mean, this team is uber talented, like so many good players on this team. So much fun to watch. Uh, and certainly like, pl- I guess, you know, played up coach certainly played into this a little bit in that he was very protective of his players. And so the, and then the media spun that in a, in a certain way to turn it into this like paranoia rather than, you know, pr- protectiveness. You could have framed it a different way, but it was the, and I don't know if that was intentional. I'm assuming it was, but I don't know. What, what's your perspective on it? No, so it was, 
coach thought on multiple levels at once. And so coach Thompson also was way ahead of his time in so many different ways. So the media was entitled mm-hmm. and used to, Hey, let me come to practice. Yeah. No, no you can't come to practice. <laughs> right. Well, Hey, I want to come in the locker room and interview your guys. Well, no, you need to go through the, our sports office and we'll give you permission when we want to interview, you know, when we want to give, we'll decide when the interview, you don't just walk in and talk to anybody you want. Okay. So nowadays you think you can walk into North Carolina's room and uh, locker room and just do an interview after the game. You think you could go to, to a Duke practice, a Kansas yeah. practice. Shoot. My son played Drexel. You think you could just walk into a Drexel <laughs> practice? No, he understood that this was an environment that these student athletes needed to be protected in. Yeah. But this was characterized as him being paranoid. And America had never seen a six foot ten, confident, loud, intelligent black man running a great basketball team before. Mm. We had seen a few black coaches, but there were very few. When John Thompson got the job in 1972, <laughs> I think there were five men coaching college basketball division one five yeah. black men and so and he's winning <laughs> and he's coming into your arena and, kick, and, and so then you talked about the team yeah his team was and for those who know and watch then th- this explanation isn't for you but yo, young people out there um his team was so physical mm. and so aggressive and took so little ish <laughs> and had so few f's to give as the young people say and and they reveled in it, yeah. and they and everybody said, "Oh!" And it was all black. That's the other thing. I'm sorry, yeah. I buried the lead. The team was all black. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's the first time that we've really seen. I'm talking one through twelve. Yep. <laughs> you know, um, and and a black coach. Mm-hmm. And so America was really unsettled by this, and they were just they were really good. You know, Patrick Ewing was you know, one of the greatest, if not the greatest college basketball player ever. But then you've got all kinds of other, you know, Reggie Williams and Michael Jackson and and Michael Graham, who's a story unto himself. So Mm. they played an extraordinarily aggressive, physical brand of basketball. And this was the game was more physical then. So if you wanted to shove somebody or or try to elbow somebody, they were they they wanted that all that smoke. Mm -hmm. And the thing and I'll finish with this. They were portrayed as thugs and bullies because they were black. But John Thompson did not change who he was or how his team played in order to cater to the to the insecurities and stereotypes that were placed on him. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why those Georgetown teams got such a special place in the hearts of black America. And everybody and and, and there was a lot of white people who rooted for them, too, although there were a lot of them who hated them. <laughs> but. He came, refused, came around, came around changed. once Iverson got there. <laughs> yeah, the Iverson thing is a different dynamic. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah different dynamic. But he refused to say, no, I'm not going to play physical. He refused to say, no, I'm not going to raise my voice to try to argue a call because y'all are scared of me because I'm six foot ten towering over the referee. What do you want me to do? Sit on a chair? Yeah. You know? And so his attitude combined with the talent and the the way they played relentless physical in your face basketball um, was terrific. It was funny, you know, and, and I think now this is, this is my own opinion. I think coach Thompson was so intelligent. He knew that and it might provide him an edge sometime. He told me, so Fred Brown won the championship with him and uh, at the point, and he said when he went to go see Fred Brown in high school, when he was checking him out recruiting, Fred got into a fight before the opening tip. <laughs> <laughs> And he He's said, like I didn't guy. want guys who could, who, who, you know, I didn't want troublemakers, but he yeah. said, my guys never lost the game in the bus on the way to the arena. <laughs> so in other words, hey, man, yeah. we're ready. You can go for it. Like, we ain't no punks over here. It was fascinating. It, I, I, I love, I, that, I love that. I love that. And we talked a little bit about that, just like language and the the use of that, you know, the, the, labeling them as aggressive you could just say that they hustle a lot, right? Like that's, it's such a softer word that could take the place of the same, the same thing because they, 
they weren't trying to beat anybody up. Although, you know, that, like you said, the style of play lent itself to that at times they wanted to win the basketball games and they, they were, they were too talented to just be like brutish or, you know, just, just trying to completely overpower people. They had too many, you know, skilled players. Ewing was unbelievable. And you, you name checked a few of the Dunbar boys and uh, yes. Michael Jackson. Like, I mean, they, they just had too many, too many dudes to just try to be a team that was just going to, you know, Oh, they were loaded, beat, man. Beat they're, you, right? they're, they're second five. Yeah, they used to, uh, a saying around Georgetown basketball was we got the best starting five in the country, and our and our second five is the second best five in the country. Yeah. Like they they had depth, talent, man. Them guys was going after it. They're going to the I final mean, four every year. You know, they got the 82 there, yeah. they're there, 83. They went and- to the final four. They they lost on a last second shot in 81 to when Michael Jordan made the shot. Yep. Um and the funny thing about that game, though, is go back and watch it. Jordan was just kind of – he was a freshman. He was kind of just hanging around, getting opportunities here and there. Worthy was the Worthy. man. <laughs> no. Including Worthy. in that steal at the end, which oh, it's so brutal. Oh, it's so brutal to watch. Right, like dunked all over this yeah. dude, man. This is before the era when things went viral like that. But, like, I yeah. mean, yeah, so so they they lost, you know, and they, they should have won the game, but Fred Brown gave away the ball yeah. by accident. You know, he passed it to – to Worthy, mm-hmm. Georgetown point guard pass it to Worthy, and John Thompson immediately went and hugged Man, him. Such a good moment, right? Like th- that's an such a coach, moment. an amazing moment, you know, a defining moment, mm-hmm. and it just said everything about who he was. So the next year they reloaded, and then they came back, went, won it in in eighty four, and and lost in a in a once in a lifetime Villanova game in eighty five. Yeah, and they beat Phi Slamma Jamma. Uh, so not 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 nobody, you know. <laughs> like, Akeem yeah, you know, thank you. Yeah. So you know, like ser- oh, man. It serious was, um, competition. It was one of the most iconic teams, but they stood for more than basketball, you know. And they were they were um, you know, it really dragged basketball into the forefront, and not only because of the team, because a black coach was leading it. Yeah. You know, a black coach was in charge, and John Thompson was very clear about I want to show black people that we can can succeed with intelligence yeah and with thinking with strategy and we're more than just athletes and he did that amazing man um where where else you want to go unlv 1990 and then of course the fab five and 93 are the are the other two that are coming out two really interesting teams as well unlv with this another (laughs) character of a coach and and tarkanian and then michigan i think defined by the the freshmen which are sophomores in 93 obviously going back to the the final absolutely so unlv um the thing about them was they had this outlaw image Mm -hmm. and the reason they had the out. So John Thompson was the pillar of morality and everything that's right. And all his players graduated Mm -hmm. and he was like this father figure, his, his teams wore uh, jackets and ties on road trips. You know, he was, he was very proper and correct with all that. Um, and, And teaching people how to succeed in life, you know, now Jerry Cartani, Tarkanian, the coach at UNLV, had this outlaw image Well, he's in Las Vegas. And there was like, you know, there was photographs of his players taken with gamblers. And, and he was, uh, John Thompson had a squeaky clean program in terms of rules violations. Mm-hmm. It just did not happen. Tarkanian, not so much. Not so much. <laughs> but he had that talent boy, you know, Larry Johnson before he was grandmama yeah. and uh, Stacy Augman. And, uh, you know, for us, Around the way, when we looked at that team, we definitely rooted for them, and they played fast and aggressive. Yeah. But then they had a dude named Moses Scurry, and Moses Scurry, uh, great and, name. Yeah, yeah, Moses Scurry. Uh, I can't remember was it him or Larry Johnson who had the gold tooth. And, and Larry and, Johnson had, had it later, at least. I don't. He might have had one. Right, and so and, and that by the way, that's spelled T O O F. Um, and, <laughs> and and like this was a new type of. You know, this was like a new thing, man. These guys had a, out, they, they played into the outlaw image and, and they was, they just ran through everybody and won it. And we, and Black America loved them, man. Yeah. And so it was a new generation of uh, Blackness that was sort of imposing itself. And there had always been great Black players and even mostly Black teams and things like that. But I guess they were a little different, man. They just had a different edge. It was a little bit out of control. Yeah. You know? John Thompson's teams were always in control. Yes. Always. 
these guys, is, you know, Tark was just a different dude, man. He was a freewheeling, wheeler, dealer type of guy. But uh, but they won it, man, and they they did their thing, and and we love them for it. Kenny Anderson loves Anderson Hunt, who was on that that team. He was he was a dude on there for Greg sure. Greg Anthony and Greg, Greg Anthony yeah, was the fifth yeah, starter. Yeah, yep. Yeah, so good. Yeah, Greg I mean, Anthony was yeah. sort of a ruffian. Yeah, like. You know, he was a very polished now, but yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Clean up. Yeah, yeah. Right. The, the funny thing is that, you know, so when I grew up, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but I'm from New York and in just the whole Northeast pretty much. And every black person hated Duke. <laughs> That's a, it's yeah. a little bit of an exaggeration. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they that's because they came back and and smashed UNLV. Mm-hmm. And you talk about the Fab Five, which was like the iconic black team of a of an era. And then Duke beat them too, you know. Yeah. But you know, to segue over to the Fab Five, they were probably what I would say the first. Like Georgetown was hip hop, but hip hop wasn't a big enough cultural force yet. Mm-hmm. Eighty four hip hop was still underground. And it's funny to say that now, you know, when hip hop is like the <laughs> dominant thing in culture yeah. and everybody listens and white people enjoy it and and everybody enjoys it, yeah. which is cool. Yeah. But in 84, man, most like black people over age 28 didn't. Like right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, like, that was the it kids thing. Even, yeah. In 84, it was barely on the radio yeah. in New York City. Yeah. Crazy. You know, and so so Georgetown had was part of the the evolution and the growth and the explosion of hip hop, but hip hop culture hadn't gotten as big as it did when the Fat Five came along yeah. and they were just super hip hop. Yeah. And so, and, and people, you know, embraced it. It sort of played off and magnified the culture. It really predated what we have right now where hip hop and, and basketball are very, you know, almost synonymous. And there's so much overlap in terms of the styles and the, the swag. And, and you got all the, the you got actually halfway decent ball players who rap. Yeah, you know right. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. and so, you know, some of the ra- again, some of the rappers can can actually play ball now. <laughs> yeah, some of Jake. Yeah. OK. Yeah. One hand. I got one hand of rabbit <laughs> you can play ball. These well, are the you ones know, I, you know. quick rabbit hole before we get back to Michigan. <laughs> okay. And I, this is like a pet peeve of mine. Okay, okay. Because rappers get out there and, and they try to act like they have game, and I really don't think You're okay. I don't. First of all, half of them dudes is like five, six. Yeah. <laughs> So have you seen the court that Drake has in his house? <laughs> yeah. So Drake is number one on the list of the rappers who think they can hoop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I'm 53 years old, I will smash Drake. Well, he's got a mix. He's got a mixtape out there. I'm sure, though. You know that that's See, that, cut that, together. That that's cut together. Me, man. Stay in your lane, bro. You make great music. That's right. Don't come over here acting like you can hoop. That irks me. That's fair. And then people don't really want to guard them because he's Drake. Yeah. yeah don't yeah. let me get in front of Drake on a court, man. I'll, I'll make. Yeah. But anyway, I think J Cole can really hoop. Yeah. I respect his game. Um, I think, uh, I hear, I think it's Dirk. I hear Dirk got, got some game on him. Um, uh, Jack Harlow, absolutely not. <laughs> and he's starring in the remake of, uh, of, of, um, White Man Can't Jump. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I get it. You have yeah. to cast him. He brings the audience, Yeah. but, and yeah, yeah, man. So, uh, yeah, it's a short list of, of rappers who can actually do But getting back to Michigan, you know, yeah. So, I guess what what I what I want to ask is like, you know, has, you got a son too in college. Like, what what do you think it would take for him to just the, like the confidence? The, I mean, I think young people have more confidence now, but in you know 1992 when they're coming into college, it still is like it feels very it felt very avant garde for what the the way they carried themselves still you know as they're the the again started like you said with with Georgetown and uh, to UNLV but UNLV is on in that Vegas West Coast thing like this is the middle of America the Big 10 they're playing against like Bobby Knight it, it is just a different thing to walk on to those courts with with carrying themselves with that confidence and that that aura and representing themselves in a way that made that you know maybe made them feel more confident you know being who they they were I don't I don't know but it also seems yeah. seems daring at the same time I think you're exactly right. And, you know, I guess we sort of, again, buried the lead and just took it for granted. But for those who don't know, 
the Michigan's Fab Five team was five freshmen. Yeah. yeah. And they came in and they were not, it wasn't like, it wasn't like now where you got these, you, you expect the freshmen to come in and and dominate and stuff like that. Like the, the development has been sped up. But, you know, you have freshmen who came in and contributed, but five of them yeah. starting <laughs> and not only starting, but wrecking shop. Yeah. You know, like, like running through cats and the confidence level, man, I think it really all sort of, I think Jalen Rose was the, the leader of that emotion that they had and that swag. Mm. And, and for those who don't know, like they played a very aggressive in your face, talking trash, mm-hmm. um, going forehead to forehead with you. If you wanted some smoke, you know, not fighting, but letting you know that, you know, ain't no punks over here. And, uh, and, and just like they did have a huge amount of confidence. And to me, that comes from a very particular type of basketball environment where people are trying to murder you out there, metaphorically speaking. Mm. And if you want to stay on this court, first of all, it wasn't like going to work out with trainers. This is the 90s, right? Yeah. So to get good, you didn't have no trainer. You didn't go and, and work out with cones and, <laughs> and, and putting stuff on the Internet. Dr. Like, Dish. You went and found a run. <laughs> And if you were good, you had to play against people who were better than you and older than you and bigger and stronger. And they grew up in that gym in St. Cecilia's gym yeah. in Detroit, Michigan, like trying to hold the court down, <laughs> you know, trying to hold the court down. And if you lose, you're not playing again. You're five games back, yeah. you know, and just that type of confidence and people really trying to take your heart and talking at you and pushing you around like Jalen Rose came through all of that fire. Plus, he was 6'8 with a handle yeah, and, and, yeah. and couldn't tell him nothing. <laughs> so I think they all fed off that, man. And yeah. and then and then they just had, you know, they had three great, you know, future all-star level NBA guys and two other dudes who was probably NBA level, but just, you know, didn't get that shot. Like, yeah. you know, Jimmy King and um, and Ray Jackson. Right there, and yeah. Juan Howard, Chris Weber, and Jalen Rose, man. It's one of the best college teams of all time as freshmen. So. That's- it, it, it was just, it was really a moment, man. And then their style, I think, the hip hop part of it came because they they were the, the shorts had been creeping down. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because in my lifetime, I've seen the shorts go, <laughs> I've actually worn the shorts. When I was in college in the 80s, they were tidy whities <laughs> And then they started going down a little bit. And MJ wore his Carolina shorts under his Bulls shorts. Yeah. That was a thing for him. And so his bull shorts were a little bigger. The shorts got a little bigger. And then all the baggy hip hop stuff started coming out. And the Fab Five had them joints down to their knees. Had the shorts down to the knees. Yeah. And then it was all bets were off. Oh. The shorts was there's TJ, a few, TJ you know, Ford when he was at Texas. Oh man. He he took it, to, it. Yeah, he took it all the way down, all the way down. <laughs> I love it. There was some shin It was yeah. cool out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the Fab Five really did that. They they all shaved their heads and yeah. they and they had the black socks. And it was just a vibe, man. It was a vibe of defiance, of resistance, mm. of we're gonna do our own thing, you know, no matter what. And uh and we're five freshmen and they went all the way to the championship game and then got blown out <laughs> by Duke. Yeah. <laughs> blown out yeah. Uh. by Duke. The, the, and, and this is in the early 90s, man. I'm telling you, man, the majority of black people hated Duke at this yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced of it. Yeah. Like, for sure. Well, know. they weren't Nike. They weren't, they weren't so associated with Nike. It wasn't so much about the sneakers at, at that time. So it was more about the schools. Yeah. Well, because Duke, you know, Duke had a higher percentage of white players and yeah. it was a type that they had. They were preppy. They yeah. were annoying. You know, Christian Leitner was, you know, it, it was an image that they had. And the image was partially true. Black people started rocking with Duke when they started recruiting one and dones. Mm-hmm. You know, it's simple as that. They started recruiting a different type of kid. Um, you know, I believe that during the 80s and early 90s, you probably needed a certain SAT score to get into to be recruited to Duke. And now you don't. Now yeah. you just need the bare minimum. Yeah. You know, so they decided to do that. More power to them. But nah, man, you know, and then the Fab Five went all the way back to the championship game in back to back years and lost on that really unfortunate Crazy timeout ending. that they didn't have called yeah. by Chris Weber. Um, I encourage everybody to watch the Fab Five documentary uh, on ESPN. Yeah. Um, it's tremendous. And it has it told me some new information about that timeout. There were guys on the bench signaling to take mm-hmm. the time out. So, uh, but despite all of that, um, the Fab Five is, uh, you know, for you guys to have those shorts. I know. Um, and the and and the whole the whole setup with with them is, um, 
you know, I think it's just it's it really makes me remember fondly to a team that changed the game. Yeah. You know, five young black kids from around the way who just changed the game of basketball and how you could express yourself on the court and the expectations we have for freshmen. It was yeah. tremendous. The enthusiasm that they that they played with was really fun. Cause I think that one of the things that happens to freshmen often is that they feel a little bottled up because they're the, if they, def, you know, don't meet expectations, they're quickly on the bench, right. For replaced by somebody else. And they, they were so talented that they demanded uh, to be on, on the court uh, through the way that they were playing. And that allowed them to just like express their, the, the, like you said, the elements of their game that people hadn't seen, you know, hadn't seen in freshman or in college basketball altogether there, the combination of players was just a lot of yeah. fun. And they were villainized because they were brash young men. And mm-hmm. at that time, you know, so this was my first job out of college. This is 92, 93. And I was actually working in Detroit for the associated press. Okay. At this point, the sports media is a lot blacker now than it was then. Yeah. You know, what's that about 30 years ago? Yep. And so uh, a lot of people hated Michigan. <laughs> Shut up, calm down. You talk too much. You're too mm-hmm. flashy. You're this, you're that. You know, like a lot of people hated them. They were the villain of the tournament. Yeah. You know, same way that Georgetown was the villain. <laughs> you know, when John Thompson would walk into some arenas, the, the opposing band would play the Darth Vader music. <laughs> <laughs> I, he, yeah, he, he might have loved that. <laughs> Let's face it, man. Let's face it. This is racist. Yes. That, it's just racist, man. Yeah, I know. It's racist. Jesus. Yo, Sports Illustrated yeah. in the Big East Championship, and I think it was 85 when they played Syracuse, one of their quote unquote great writers did the write up on the Big East Championship game. And the first Curry Kirkpatrick, and the first sentence of the article was, those noted scholars from Georgetown. Oof. Yeah. Oh, are you serious? That is so racist. So, and so this is the environment that these guys were playing in. Yeah. And then and people hate them because of it. Yeah. You know? so, so they went through it like. I hope everybody who who buys the gear and sports it sort of reps it like it's sort of come full circle. Mm-hmm. And these, and we understand now what was going on and why these teams were important and sort of some of the things that they had to go through, they had to win with that on their back. Yeah. And so, so um, yeah, use it to give you courage and confidence and, and go out there. I know a lot of, uh, you know, learning about history and about, uh, people that went through things that are what you know ten times worse than things that I've had to go through inspires me through to through tough the tough things that you do have to go through and feel lucky that you you don't have to go through that level, uh, but you can learn from the way that they carried themselves through those moments and it can inspire you to do to do your best in those tough times. That's true, man. And there were a lot of white allies that were involved with these teams, you know, and and really championed these causes. Um, you know, John Thompson gives a huge amount of credit to the people he worked with, his assistant, Mary Fenlon, his mm. athletic director, Frank Rienzo, the presidents of his universities. You know, Jerry Tarkanian had the courage to let these guys go out there. The Fab Five was coached by a white guy, Steve Fisher, who yeah. had to take some flack. You're starting five freshmen? Mm-hmm. You know, really? Hey, do you know who was on that team? One of the guys who lost his spot to the freshman? Who's that? Rob Alinka. Oh, yeah, that's right. Of the Lakers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> You yeah, know, that's funny. Um, and so so, you know, there's a lot of uh, I don't want to just say, you know, um, there were a lot of people uh, who were allies of the black community and who are on the right side of history. So, yeah. you know, um, it's that's why the the gear and the memories and the legacy it is, you know, as as in the black community, we're very proud of it. And we feel, um, you know, uh, a sense of ownership, but not exclusivity. Yeah, no doubt. That's the way I, no I doubt. I love that. Well, tell me about before I, before I get you out of here. Tell me about uh, what you're what you're doing now, because I've I've seen snippets of uh, projects. So tell tell me what you can about yeah, what you're, man, what well, you're working on. The big one is that um, uh, I'm fortunate to be helping Rich Paul write his life story, <laughs> and it's called Lucky Me. It's out in June. Um, it's being published by Jay Z's book imprint, who's like um, a, a friend and a mentor of Rich's. And so rich to me, and we're talking about this journey of African-Americans in sports. Mm -hmm. And um, for those of you out there, the the few of you who still like to read books, um, (laughs) there's a there's a there's a an essential seminal book about the history of the black athlete. And it's called 40 Million Dollar Slaves by the great writer Bill Roden, who I'm proud to call a colleague right now who I work with at Anscape. And um, this book really shows how the development of the black athlete covering all these eras that we've talked about 
in all these different sports, mostly um, football and basketball. But then, and it was published about 20 years ago and it Mm. stops and we bump our head up against the ceiling when it comes to control and full economic participation Mm -hmm. in these sports in terms of ownership, coaching position. Um, It was written at the tail end of Michael Jordan's era where Michael Jordan felt that he would sacrifice his financial opportunities if he was outspoken in terms of black causes. Michael Jordan did not really speak out like that. Um, But now Rich really represents this era of full black empowerment. Mm -hmm. So Rich Paul, um, he did not grow up with LeBron, contrary to popular opinion. (laughs) Rich Paul is from Cleveland and had a whole separate upbringing. And he met LeBron when LeBron was in high school, met him by accident, and they became friends. And Rich Paul has a set of experiences that prepared him to do exactly what he's doing now, which is running the, the what I consider the most important and disruptive and game-changing sports agency in the world. Mm. And so he started Clutch Sports. And there's a big misperception that, oh, LeBron just hooked him up mm. and he's a puppet for LeBron. Really, Rich is the leader. Mm. And in the, in the group dynamic, Rich was the older guy who taught these guys things. And ha- he has all these tremendous leadership characteristics that LeBron recognized and said, hey, man, when I go to the league, I want you with me. I want Maverick and I want Randy. Mm. He didn't even grow up with Rich. And then down the line, Rich learned the business and looked around and he said, okay, I want to be an agent. Mm -hmm. And and actually LeBron wasn't his first client. (laughs) You know, it was Eric Bledsoe. (laughs) And then Tristan Thompson and Corey Alexander and LeBron. And so from those four guys, he now has in the NBA, he probably has 50 clients. Um, I think he had eight guys in the all-star game last year. Um, and he's got football clients. He represents coaches, general Gosh. managers, um, clutch sports. Um, he was invested in by United Talent Agency and Rich is now on the board of directors wow. at Clutch Sports. But really his book deals with, okay, this is what prepared me for all that. Mm. My childhood and young adulthood. This is what I did. This is how I grew up in Cleveland. This is what I experienced. And this, all of this explains why I'm here today. The end of his book is him meeting LeBron. Mm. I, don't, I mean, that'll be awesome because I, I think that was, for me, so much of Coach Thompson's book was a lot about him growing up, going uh, to his families, you know, out outside of the city and, you know, just all that stuff was fascinating because it tells you where that, where the character comes from and it, and it, exactly. humani- it humanizes people too, because you can see the sort of caricature that the that they become in the like the social media or the larger media and that's just not the at the core who they are and if you get to hear a little bit about what you know what made them it makes them it rounds them out so much more very much so very much so i mean that's sort of the goal like if you if 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 we're able to do these books well then you can understand this person and why they do the things that they do and how they're able to do them because you know what built them. You know, yeah. Rich says in his book, man, a lot of people, they make assumptions about me, but they don't know what kind of assembly line I was built on. Mm. And once you know that, you get much more of a picture about who he is. So, man, I'm just, you know, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to work with these people to help them tell their story. Um, you know, these books belong to them, not me. It's an act of service for them um, because I think that their stories are important, you know, and, and it's funny, you know, Rich Paul right now is in the phase of his career that John Thompson went through, but we like to forget about. Mm. So Coach Thompson, when he was 40 years old, everybody hated him. Mm -hmm. I say everybody. He was, you know, he was the villain. He was Darth Vader. He was a bully. He was loud. He was too aggressive. He was too this and too that. And a lot of people hated John Thompson. (laughs) As the years went by, after the Iversons, after all this and all that, then we understood, oh, okay, we understand what kind of, mm. and then the same way America did with Martin Luther King, yeah. Martin Luther King was hated by the majority of Americans up until his death, but now everybody loves him and understands him. Mm. So Rich Paul now is 40 and he gets a lot of hate <laughs> and a lot of envy and a lot of jealousy. And so I expect that as people come to know him more and really understand him, then I, I hope that, that the country comes to really Uh, celebrate him for the contributions he's making in terms of getting equal opportunity in ownership and control of the sport Mm. 
instead of just being a player. That's great. I hope so. I hope him and LeBron get a get a uh, team in Las Vegas. Maybe you know it could be. I think that's cool. inevitable, man. Yeah. I mean, LeBron. I mean, it's amazing. I it's know. just and, it and to go, you know, just you know, I I get chills thinking about it. I'm a little I'm a, at a loss for words. But in this conversation, right, we've gone from talking about these eras, you know, where of of black athletes going through the worst type of things to black athletes, everyone standing on the previous generation's shoulders to now it can be like, Oh yeah, LeBron's going to own a team. (laughs) I know. Oh, Rich Paul, you know, is one of the most powerful guys in the league, a black agent, you know, a young, a young black agent who didn't check all the boxes and go through all the jump through all the hoops that, that you're supposed to, to jump through, you know? Um, and so to me, it's like, we're, we're in an age now where all of the sacrifices of the Bill Russell's and the John Thompson's mm-hmm. and, and, and all the ones that we don't know about in the John McClendon's they're bearing fruit. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for that, that we've made it. And there's more work to do, but it's no just, doubt. I think, um, Anybody who doesn't appreciate the journey, man, should really read up and, yeah, and give them a for facts. sure. For sure. Well, I so appreciate it, man. I'm I can't wait to to read that when it comes out. Or or maybe you'll do an audio book again. I listened to the audio book last time. So uh pick up. Yeah, the Rich audio is book. gonna do his own audio. Oh, he's gonna do it. Oh, so okay. That, okay. Uh, that's yeah, that sounds good. Now, I will say this, cool. and I know and like we you know, I make jokes about it, but you know, people with the reading and the reading is not that popular now. But <laughs> Coach Thompson was 70 something, Rich is 40. So his book is shorter for all y'all who <laughs> quick read, but Perfect. it's powerful, man. It's a lot yeah. packed into it. So that means I he can do an- another, that means he can do another one Thank later. You for listening to the night. 19- Boom. There you go. <laughs> you all right, right Jesse. To the podcast. Make sure you Thanks so much. And while you're at it, leave us a rating or review. Five stars only like the basketball camp. We also have links to all of 19.9 social media. So you never miss a release until next time. 